Added to the fear of contracting the virus in a pandemic are the significant changes to our daily lives as our movements are restricted in support of efforts to contain and slow down the spread of the coronavirus. Faced with new realities of working from home, homeschooling our children and lack of physical contact with other family members, friends and colleagues, it is important that we take good care of our mental health. To speak about just that, we have with us Vikram Patel, the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health in the Blavatnik Institute's Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is also an adjunct professor and joint director at the Center for Chronic Conditions and Injuries at the Public Health Foundation of India. He will be in conversation with senior journalist and author Kaveri Bamzai. You know, one of the things I heard you talking about recently was this uh, idea of the unconditional income support to prevent stress and mental health illness. That's a fantastic idea. Would you like to discuss it a little more? Absolutely. Uh, actually, I've had the privilege of mentoring uh, a very bright young Brazilian postdoctoral fellow uh, who works with me in my lab in Harvard. And uh, she has been uh, analyzing the impact of Brazil's conditional cash transfer program, which is probably the largest direct to uh, beneficiary cash transfer program uh, that was launched by the government of Lula uh, about 20 years ago. And it was really an effort to raise uh, 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 the income levels of the poor in Brazil and reduce disparities. It is astonishing, Kaveri, her data shows, and this is more than 100 million people, so it's the largest almost a countrywide program. Her data shows convincingly that when people receive conditional cash transfers, not only is their economic status improved, but suicide mortality has dropped by 50%, as much as 50% during the decade uh, following receipt of the conditional cash transfer, and in particular amongst young people, and the disparities between uh, the, the Black Brazilians, which is historically one of the more disadvantaged communities in Brazil, and, and white Brazilians has narrowed. Mm -hmm. um, to me, this is the largest compelling demonstration about the value of conditional cash transfers or even unconditional cash transfers like universal basic income interventions um, on promoting the mental health of populations, particularly those who are economically in the weaker segments of society. Would a Manrega not qualify as a, as a cash transfer? Would it, has there, any, has, uh, there been any study that looks at uh, this? Well, MN Riga is a cash transfer program. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously, though, it is linked to actually having rural employment. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, obviously, if there is no jobs in the rural area, then you're not going to get rural employment. So in, in that sense, it is a cash transfer program with, with lots of restrictions and limitations. The whole, okay. the Brazilian program is direct to the beneficiary. You don't wow. actually have to be working at all. Um, so I think there are differences, but at, fundamentally, there is a commonality in that the state is directly transferring money uh, to people who are uh, relatively poor uh, and therefore have no other source of income. Uh, now that said, a bigger question is, have we evaluated yes. the impact of MN Rega on people's health and, uh, and well-being, particularly their mental health? Not that I know of, um, but I will say something very curious about our cash transfer programs, um, which is the opposite of giving a, ca a, 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 you know, a cash to help people promote their mental health. And that is, of course, the compensation we give families of farmers who've committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And I remember very vividly, you know, um, uh, I used to work a lot in the Vidarbha area for many years. And I remember very vividly being in one of the uh, villages where there had been a number of farmer suicides. Uh, and I remember this, uh, this woman whose husband had died uh, coming to me in tears. And she said, you know, we got this, we got this compensation after my husband killed himself. I do not understand why the government didn't give him the money in the form of debt relief. It was, you know, and I stood there, you know, uh, and I had no answer. And I said, so we have effectively incentivized suicide. Um, it's such a bizarre policy uh, dynamic that instead of saying, let us give money to those who need it right. so that they can actually get on with their lives and rebuild their lives. Instead, we say, no, after you kill yourself, we we'll okay. then give the money to your surviving family. I don't know. This is a kind of perverse system that I that defies any logic here. Uh, but anyway, that's you know that's a contrast to a lot of our cash transfer uh, programs in India. We give it at the wrong time uh, rather than and, and, and you know it's not a preemptive 
uh, cash transfer. It's actually a reactive cash transfer, which I think is um, a wasted opportunity and a wasted life. That's people live all over again. The movie was all about this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Terrific actually, uh, of course, yeah. I remember the movie. Terrific yeah. film. Yeah. You know, the other thing that um, has struck me over uh, uh, this period that we've been through is the uh, family dynamic. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about domestic violence, about physical and psychological abuse within the family increasing. Again, I've not read any data as such, but there's been a lot of conversation around that. Um, have you looked at that, uh, especially in India? We've heard a lot of cases of um, substance abuse as well going up, especially alcohol. Have you seen that? Have you studied that? You know, I'll tell you, Kaveri, one of the real problems right now with the pandemic is how little reliable data there is on all of these um, consequences of the pandemic and particularly the consequences of the lockdown and, and the containment policy. So what we rely on isn't really the kind of data that I would say can easily generalize to the whole country. The qualitative studies, uh, very focused deep dives, individual uh, narratives of their experiences, etc. cetera. Uh, the extent to which we can generalize this, I don't know, but those stories certainly speak to the, you know, the, what you just described, that the vulnerabilities of women who already were vulnerable because they live, for example, in relationships where there was uh, spousal violence has increased dramatically. Mm -hmm. The vulnerabilities of children living in those families to be exposed to violence has increased. And of course, now children are trapped at home, uh, exactly. oftentimes with nowhere else to go. And school is often an escape. It's not just a yeah. place, you know, where kids went to learn geography and history. It's a place where kids went often to get away from very yeah. difficult home environments to get food, uh, to be able to play, to be able to interact with one's peers. But, you know, so all of these, there's a lot of qualitative data that I think speaks to, uh, uh, speaks to this. But if I had to look at quantitative data, we already have very good quantitative data from other countries. Yeah. Um, and there is no reason for me to believe that India is going to somehow necessarily be totally different. Yeah. And the one country, you know, as you know, I live between India and the US, in the US, we now have robust quantitative data that is showing without any doubt that mortality, which is the, the hard outcome of uh, that we're all concerned with, um, has risen in the last year due to suicide and substance use. Um, this is a very dangerous trend in the US um, and it is being attributed. Uh, obviously, these are early data. In fact, this is actually a report that is still confidential but will be published in the very near future. Uh, but what it's clearly indicating is that there is a crisis of mental health in the US that is playing itself out, not just in terms of people reporting poor mental health symptoms, uh, but actually people taking actions that can ultimately lead to the loss of their own lives. For example, through heavy drinking, uh, the use of more dangerous substances like opioids, as well as, of course, suicide. Uh, unfortunately, our data systems in India are nowhere near as real time as, as, as the one in the US. So we'll probably only know what the impact has been in the, in the last year and in, you know, perhaps in a year from now, uh, which is unfortunate. Do you feel that the family has changed fundamentally during this period? Uh, uh, and uh, is, is that change irreversible? Or, or uh, can we make interventions to actually prevent a lot of the psychological uh, abuse that has happened? You know, uh, uh, Kaveri, I, I wouldn't be able to comment specifically on the change in the family during the last year. I don't, I don't have that kind of information to comment on it. But I will say one thing is that actually working with families, in my mind, is the most important way to prevent gender-based violence. Uh, right now, our state policy is very, again, very reactive. Yeah. We wait for the violence to occur. And then we try to help uh, uh, the woman who is affected uh, to find a way around that. And in a patriarchal society like ours, we know that actually the vast majority of women neither seek that kind of help because they're, you know, in a sense, in a in trap, really, in this kind of society that they are living in, but also that the solutions we're offering them, that is to criminalize their male partner yeah. uh, or to get them to leave homes are really acceptable to a very small fraction yes. uh, of, of women in our country. So I strongly believe that we do need to look at prevention, primary prevention, which is to say to prevent the violence from occurring in the very first place. Right. 
And while we have good legislative instruments for that, I, I, I fear those legislative instruments are still too reactive. Uh, they're very punitive. Um, they're very much around the idea of criminalizing a, 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 the male perpetrator. I believe the really exciting kind of evidence that we are gen the people are generating in India, there's a team, for example, that is uh, working from Nari in Pune, uh, which is looking at interventions that can work on spousal relationships, couple dynamics. Okay. Uh, and I've always wondered, you know, why do we not use the opportunity when couples register to get married to you require them to actually have a month or, or you know, a, a, you know, intense deep dive uh, of, of understanding how to live with someone else? Right. Let's not forget that for a significant majority of young people who are going to get married in India, their first sexual encounter, yes. their first encounter of living with someone in a romantic relationship, their first encounter of being able to create a new family for themselves will happen on the night of their marriage. Yes. And it is like, you know, there's no preparation. Yeah. Their own parents have not prepared them. School education, the sex education, the life skills you get there is pretty, you know, in most cases, it's very poorly delivered and it's pretty primitive. Uh, they have no knowledge. Right. Uh, and I think this could be such an exciting uh, and um, preventative uh, intervention, not only to prevent domestic violence, uh, but actually to promote mental health and well-being for both uh, young men and young women who are about to get married. I think that's fascinating. You know, uh, Dr. Patel, you've also talked about this whole idea how because of the criminalizing of a lot of love as well, especially if it's interfaith, even that escape, even that freedom, once it gets criminalized, I mean, where does it leave young people? It leaves them very de dejected, doesn't it? Well, Kaveri, you know, I, as you, I think you're referring to my recent writings here. Yes. Let, me, let me tell you, first of all, India has a crisis of young people's mental health. Yeah. Every metric, whether it, and I, you know, by, by crisis, I don't mean just, you know, young people are angry or young people are sad. No, young people are killing themselves, um, you know, in, in epic numbers. Uh, uh, the, India's youth suicide rate is one of the highest on the planet, um, you know, and it has been steadily going up over the last decade. Um, we've known about this, and by the way, these are not my data, these are the government's own data, you know, so it's, there's the no NCRB secret about data. it. Yeah. Correct, the NCRB data and the RGI data, the million death study that the Registrar General of India uh, conducts, which I think is far more reliable, you know, because it's not based on police records, but actually, uh, uh, um, you know, or cause of death assessments in a, in a, in a representative sample of a million households in the country. So this, the fact is that there is a crisis of young people's mental health. The fact is we have no policy response to it. We have a national mental health policy, uh, which is a policy, but actually there is very little recognition of the differing needs of young people and the rest of the population. And also the fact that most young people's mental health problems are not just linked to some kind of biological medical condition or a psychiatric disorder. It's got to do with the social environments that young people are finding themselves in. And one of those very important social drivers of young people's suicide and poor mental health is the denial of opportunities that fit the aspirations of India's millennials. And those aspirations are totally different from those of their parents. Mm. They are shaped by India's economic development story. They're shaped by globalization. And of course, they're shaped by social media. And so we have this, this generation of India's youth who have different aspirations from that of their parents and grandparents. Right. And there is a real, literally a real battle about whose aspirations are going to prevail. Mm. And in that battle right now, the emergence of very conservative, orthodox attitudes about young people's sexuality and the, their, their right to choose who they love, who mm. they live with, is I think at the forefront of what is driving many young people to become depressed yes. and ultimately to kill themselves. Right. Um, Dr. Patel, you've also argued for the decriminal, uh, decriminalizing of marijuana, which again is a very uh, contentious uh, topic in India. But I mean, it stands to reason, doesn't it? Uh, uh, of, of course, a lot of people feel that it's the gateway to harder drugs. But what do you think? I mean, what do you think should happen in India? We don't have I mean, we don't have an obvious uh, opioid crisis, but I think we do have uh, a, a rising drug issue in India. 
Yeah, we definitely, um, you know, we, it's, it's not a, it's not a clear cut uh, case. It depends very much on, a, you know, assessing the relative costs and benefits of a total prohibitionary policy on yeah. any substance has to be then balanced against the similar cost benefit analysis of a more liberal decriminalized or even a legalized policy um, and uh, one has to one has to really judge the the, the the this in a very empirical way one can't be guided only by one's ideology mm -hmm. and this is my understanding of the situation that by criminalizing about what could be potentially 10% of India's population, uh, you are not going to achieve any kind of development uh, 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 goal, especially when 99% of those 10% will never graduate to most serious substances. That's the first thing to bear in mind. So in order to control the gateway to harder drugs by slamming a criminal charge on the overwhelming majority of users of cannabis who will never get into most serious drug use seems to me to be completely counterintuitive. Instead, there are many other ways that I know work in the public health context that can help minimize the graduation into more serious drugs. So that's the first thing to say. The second, the opioid crisis in the US, which is the one we, which is where the country, you know, the country that's been worst affected is not just simply about the availability of drugs. It's about the medical industrial complex. There is a rich history about this. It is about pharmaceutical companies that were heavily lobbying the US government to make pain relief uh, one of the five cardinal signs uh, of, um, of patient care. The US Congress actually passed a law requiring doctors to actually prescribe medications that their pharmaceutical donors and sponsors were saying they should prescribe. It is a systematic collusion between doctors, pharmacists, uh, the pharmaceutical industry and elected officials. And I think we should not think the opioid is the problem here. The, the problem is the commercialization and the deep, deep state, the dark state that exists between the pharmaceutical lobby uh, and politicians. We need to protect India from that. Right. If there is one lesson, what is far more dangerous than the drug itself is the collusion of private sector commercial interests with the uh, with, with, with legislative uh, legislation and, 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 and our elected officials. As long as we continue to make sure that if we decriminalize drugs, but do it purely under a state sponsored policy, right. where the sale and distribution of drugs is entirely controlled by the state, uh, is heavily regulated, is heavily taxed, in the, under the same kinds of rules in many ways to what we do for tobacco, mm -hmm. Actually, tobacco is commercialized, and you can see that. Uh, that but you know, if you remove the commercial uh, uh, interest, but but everything else is similar to tobacco: taxation, right. the prohibition of young people's use, provision of counselling for those who want to stop, etc. I believe that is a safe and more balanced policy uh, towards uh, a cannabis in our country. Right. Let's go back a little to uh, the mental health issue, the uh, uh, the pandemic. Um, uh, how did you see uh, India reacting? Uh, I'm, I'm especially concerned about the middle class because, you know, they've often been the intellectual and emotional leaders of the country. I, f I had the sense that when we saw the kind of migration happening, uh, you know, people just uh, being abandoned, I had the sense that we uh, displayed an utter lack of empathy and sensitivity. Do you feel that somewhere the middle class has lost that uh, leadership of uh, uh, the country in a way? Yeah, well, Kaveri, this is such a troubling question, you know, because obviously you and me belong to that same class. Yeah. Uh, and so we're talking about our own class. Uh, ourselves. <laughs> ourselves and our class, you know, our families, our, our social networks, people we, we dine with, we yeah. live with. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, I was devastated by how my class, our class has responded, but not surprised. Mm. Um, I think what the pandemic has done is expose the deep class divisions that have existed in this country for decades. Um, but I have to say the degree of callousness that was, was displayed by uh, the upper and middle classes, a small cabal of those classes, the, uh, the, uh, the legislators of our country, uh, the wealthy more generally, to the plight of the vast majority of our country who found themselves dispossessed on the streets, hungry, 
trudging home under the most appalling conditions and facing police violence as they did that left me completely stunned. And I'm sure, you know, um, you, know you, you must know of the book by Harsh Mandar, uh, Locking Down the Poor. Oh my God, I that do, is such an is, indictment of us. Yeah, it is a heart-rending and brutal, but absolutely on the mark account of how India's upper classes looked away when the majority of our people uh, were, were needed us the most. Um, okay. And I believe this, this division has also woken up the rest of our country to realizing how callous, selfish, and uncaring upper classes are. Yeah. And that when it comes to um, the crunch, India's poor and marginalized are on their own. Absolutely. We're not gonna be standing out for them. Right. And I think that's a terribly harsh lesson, isn't it? Well, I mean, it is a harsh, harsh lesson and it tells you how long a distance we have to go as a society to build a civil society that right. is truly integrated. We talk of national identity. To me, actually, I don't think we have one. If there was ever a proof that we don't, don't stand together as a nation, what happened during and after the lockdown is vivid proof that we only stood for ourselves and our particular class. Uh, that is what mattered. You know, I remember the Resident Welfare Association colonies of Delhi where the only concern of the colonies was not to let my servants go out of the house because they will bring the virus back and infect me. As opposed to thinking, what are my servants' families doing as they are locked into my house and they are locked out of the colony? Right. It staggered the imagination that all that we could think about was our own safety and our own needs. And that it almost became at times conversations I would have with people in those colonies. It almost sounded like you're talking about slaves. Uh, you know, you're talking about indentured laborers, you know. It was shocking, beyond belief shocking. But I think um, the good thing I'll tell you in this is that the vast majority of India's people now realize yeah. uh, that we are not going to be around for them and that they're gonna to have to make the right decisions in terms of their livelihoods, uh, the political choices they make, um, that is going to actually stand for their interests. Yeah, and I hope they make the right choices. The other thing I think that we've not talked about enough as a society is the impact on young children who've actually lost a year of socializing, of playing with uh, their peers, of studying in classrooms, you know, especially early, early age. I wonder what kind of impact it must have had on their um, psychology. Yeah, I have been very worried about this, Kaveri. You know, um, you know, the first thing to say is that that's another great example of how those who have no voice yeah. uh, have had no place at the table when decisions were made. Right. We've just talked about the migrant workers and more generally India's, uh, you know, daily wage workers, not just migrant workers. Let's be honest, you know, the people who are most affected by the lockdown are those who earn every day. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I don't earn every day. It affected me not at all. Um, you know, um, uh, but if I was earning every day, what I ate tomorrow was based on what I earned today. Right. Uh, um, then obviously a, a strategy like a lockdown basically means I'll go hungry tomorrow. And so will my wife or my, or my husband and my kids. So in the same way, I would argue children's voices have also been completely blanked out. Right. Yet we have taken away from children the single most important sector for their development and their well-being, which is their school, schools. Yeah. What, have we, what have we done? We've yeah. essentially reduced schools to places of learning, yeah. firstly, which is, of course, a completely false and narrow narrative of what schools actually are for yeah. kids. But secondly, we've assumed that all of India's kids have access to remote learning opportunities. Exactly. I mean, I cannot even... It's a mind. It's, it's mind-boggling, right? I mean, you're living in a country, you say... I mean, are you even aware of what India's children's experiences are to assume that teachers and institutions, you know, particularly in the government sector and the kids who go there will automatically pivot to remote learning? I mean, are you even living in a real India? Do you have connection with reality? And, you know, again, I have to say it's another great example of how we have totally thrown our children under the bus. Uh, uh, you know, in Goa, where I am right now, here's the incredible thing. Casinos have already opened. Yeah. Casinos opened three to four months ago. Schools, schools are still closed. Just think about that. 
who have we prioritized gamblers to come to goa to gamble on ships versus our own children to get into schools and start doing what schools uh, you know in experience yeah. what schools actually offer uh, children what a bizarre set of policies uh, you know how we prioritize in this country sometimes leaves me completely baffled absolutely and i think you only have to be uh, present at uh, you know when a midday meal uh, is served to see the hunger you know and it's it's so brutal you know when you see children just lining up to eat just that experience just take i mean forget about learning forget about socializing some people some kids just come to eat you know they don't Absolutely. get and by the way by the way kavi that's not only true in india this is also true in the us um you know my my own colleagues uh, in, in harvard you know when the pandemic began they were calling for school closures and this was a uh, you know obviously done to only control the pandemic they hadn't thought about the impact that had on kids today uh, uh, the same very same colleagues say well actually the the policy should be this and i'm going to i'm actually going to paraphrase what they said schools should be the last to close right. and the first to open yeah and i think that tells you why uh, you know what the central role of schools are for children's lives the last to close in a in a in a situation obviously right. there will be situations where we have to close that but they should be the last sector of society to close and the very first to open before planes start flying before casinos start operating yeah. before holidays begin start schools right um have we in a sense have we recovered from this pandemic i know we are talking about the vaccine and how things will go back to what they were have we recovered psychologically have we recovered mentally or have we regressed in many ways uh, as as a you know you've seen two societies quite closely now uh, over over the last 9 uh, months what is the has there been any fundamental change you know i i because this is such a fast changing uh, situation yeah. you know i can only speak for now maybe by tomorrow the situation will change again some new variant will appear and etc but from what we know right now what we can see right now i have to say i detect a real shift in mood um i find that people are a lot more optimistic uh you know uh, there is a sense that okay we finally beaten this damn thing um and i have to say there is a real growing confidence again in science which i which i think is one of the positive things that come out of this whole pandemic because let's not let's not minimize the miracle yeah. that has happened in the last year it's truly a miracle uh, kaveri yeah. the miracle that just over a year ago a new unknown pathogen spread across the world yeah. and in just about a year we now have effective incredibly effective yeah. vaccines uh many different ones as well it is a true miracle of science and i think if there's anything that if there's one positive there are many things that should come out of the pandemic of course but amongst them one that i think should really be very important is the value of science uh as a central component of a country's development policy the other thing i will also add is the value of a strong public health care system because where has the public health care system been until the vaccination campaign began they they are really the foundation if today we're able to reach as many people as we have it is thanks to our public health care system yeah, and i think this is another you know for the first time people of our class are going to government hospitals to get a covid vaccine because that's the only place you could go and i think we're finally seeing that this is a sector that belongs to all of us all of us and it is something we should demand our government to strengthen that's and invest in you know when we start doing that to our government schools that's when real change will happen as well these two sectors if we if the middle class starts taking it seriously i think you know there'll be a world of change but um you know you talked about this confidence in science uh, but uh, going forward do you see it being part of policy in any way uh, do you see um, uh, you know for instance we've been working on the hiv vaccine for the longest time nothing came of it although a lot of those people were actually redeployed to uh, you know um, work on uh, to research this vaccine but um, given that this is supposed to occur or recur do you think that that uh, uh, value of science will remain 
Well, you know, I every virus is different. You yeah. know, uh, the fact is, you're right about the HIV. You know, HIV is not the only one. Malaria is another one. Malaria, uh, yeah. uh, so, you know, I, it's not as if, I mean, you know, the immune response and um, to every pathogen is the same, yeah. you know. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, oh, we succeeded in, in, yeah. in COVID, but we failed in HIV. I think there are very fundamental differences between these infections. What I will say is that in spite of our mixed a mixed history of success uh, against infectious diseases, the last year therefore must be seen as even a super miracle that an unknown pathogen a year ago has led to all these successful vaccines. If anything, I believe that this is a call to action, a call to arms. And by the way, I wouldn't only say this is a call to arms for our government, it also is for the private sector to invest in basic research and development but also translational research, which is to say a vaccine is only going to be uh, used if you can prove that it works at the population level. So what we really need is a kind of a pipeline from the lab, from the bench, uh, where you know vaccines are being engineered to clinical science where vaccines are being tested in you know control settings, ultimately to population uh, uh, science where uh, vaccines are being tested on scale. And we've seen this happen remarkably with the COVID vaccines, uh, in, especially the homegrown one, uh, you know, Covaxin. Uh, they've really gone through every step. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's an exemplar of what uh, India can achieve if they are provided, if, if people are provided with the right resources, um, both intellectual, but also monetary. I wanted to ask you about the deaths of despair, which you've been talking about for a while, the impact of the 2008 recession on uh, uh, mental health and you uh, divided it into the mood and anxiety conditions abuse. Do you feel the recession uh, in uh, sort of engendered by this pandemic will also have maybe a bigger uh, kind of, uh, you know, global despair? Will it remain? So a couple of things, you know, I think context is really important. Context yeah. is terribly important for the pandemic. As yes. we've seen right now, the countries with the least human resources for health and the least per capita spending on health have done the best. Yes. Um, and, it you know, so fascinating. it is totally fascinating. And, you know, people say it's about India. No, it's not actually. India is actually a pretty, uh, pretty high mortality rate compared to yeah. Africa. So, you know, there's something else going on and, you know, time will tell what it is. But, I mean, you know, I've always argued from the very beginning that context is important. Right. And a one size fits all has never been true of any epidemic. And it was absurd to me that right at the outset of this epidemic, we assumed that what happened in Northern Italy, what happened in New York City was uh, immediately what was, was going to happen in Mumbai and Johannesburg. And I, I think it, it's, it staggers the imagination that a, more than a century of knowledge about how important context is uh, in, in the spread of the epidemic was thrown out uh, and we just assumed a one size fits all. Anyway, on the, in the same note, you can apply the same to mental health. So for example, the opioid crisis, as I mentioned earlier, in the US cannot be seen independently of the incredible medical industrial complex of the US. Um, and so that doesn't exist in India. Uh, you know, for example, opioids are not manufactured in the kind of way they're in the US, etc. So I don't fear about opioids in India as I do in the US. Similarly, when it comes to suicide, um, there is a very particular context in the US of suicide uh, of a particularly working class and especially white Americans. And a lot of that has to do also with white privilege and the loss of white privilege, particularly in rural uh, counties of the US. Again, that doesn't translate uh, to India in the same way. In India, what I would worry about is not so much the economic recession, because I believe that we will bounce back because, you know, this is still a country with a huge internal market. I believe it's orthodoxy. Right. I believe it's polarization. I believe it's the rising oppression of young people to express who they are as individuals, whether it's their politics, whether it's social causes they champion, whether it's their romantic interests. Mm -hmm. It is this which is the single biggest threat to um, young people's mental health. I also believe, to be honest, when it comes to farmers, um, that uh, if policies don't take into account their own economic security, um, and there are many ways of doing that, I'm not an expert in that, in that uh, and I'm not making a judgment for or against the farm laws either. I'm just simply saying that whatever policies are made, if we do not take into account the vulnerable smallholding farmer 
uh, we will get the same problem as we saw as, as the US has seen, which is dramatic increases in suicide and substance use in the most vulnerable farmers, and of course, therefore, a worsening of our suicide crisis. Absolutely. Great. It's been great talking to you, Dr. Patel, as always. It's so illuminating and you put everything into perspective and you give us context. And I wanted to recall um, Arundhati Roy's words in Harsh Pandha's book, uh, where she said the, uh, the pandemic was not just a mirror, but an x-ray. And I thought, wasn't that so perfect? It really was an x-ray of our society, of who we are. Yeah, I think she uses the word the pandemic as a portal. Yeah. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I think uh, that's exactly the way I see it too. It has exposed historic divisions in our society. Right. It has exposed a number of fracture lines in our yeah. country. Um, it's, they've always been around. The pandemic has not created them, but it certainly brought them into full relief. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. For Thank you, Kaveri. Up. Thank you so much for interviewing me. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed that session. If you want to catch the other sessions of the Thinkadu Conclave 2021, you can log on to eventexpress.com, newindianexpress.com, or even edxlive.com. If you are more of a social media person, you can also join us on our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube handle. Thank you for watching.